with you guys. Man, I'm just ready to worship. We were, we were in the green room just praying together and there's just a real hunger in our group right now. And these, just, these last couple sessions have just been personally so impactful for me. And so I don't have any pretty words. I just wanna follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit. I wanna get out of the way. So we're just gonna sing. That's what we're here to do, right? So come on, let's just begin to raise our voices. Just the sound of hungry people right now. Hungry sons and daughters. Thirsty for the fountain of God.
found in your presence there is joy to be found in your presence so drop your chains today cause it's burning Like I 
They prematurely ended that one. <laughs> Keep that four on the floor going again. My brother Joel's got a word in the song he's going to help lead, so he's going to release it. Hey, what's your name? What's your name? What's your name? Hannah. Hey, can you keep singing that there's joy in your presence thing? Hey, hey and what's your name in the b bass player? What's your name, bro? Okay, I can't hear you, but I, wa I want you to keep driving it. So if you have a pick, just go. No, 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 no. If you don't have a pick, just you can just do it with your finger. I just want you guys, I wanted us to not miss this moment. Did you feel faith whenever she started singing there's joy in your presence? You felt that, right? So Jesus is walking around the room right now, and he's um, authoring faith for all of us for a reason. How many of you have or feel tired, just in general? Okay. Psalm 16, verse 11 says, You will show me the way of life, granting me the joy of your presence and the pleasures of living, you, of living with you forever. Another version would say, You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. And I feel like we're gonna go back into this little thing that she, you were singing, the joy in your presence today. I'm not sure how it was. You could just sing it however you want, but just sing that. And I really want you guys, all of us, to engage in this because there is a freedom to be had if we come together and sing this. Does that make sense? If everyone, I want, I want you to know, if everyone in this room decides to go there together, it'll be unity and unity demands a blessing. So I want you to lift up your hands and you may, you may never, you, maybe you don't dance naturally, but I'm going to highly encourage you to forget about the people here and respond to the Lord. Because get this, no one here died for you on the cross. Okay. And so believe me, it doesn't really matter what the person next to you think. They're in a week from now, they're not going to remember you choosing to dance. They're going to remember to feed their dog or clean their children or something. So I'm just going to lead you guys in this. I mean, honestly, I'm, you guys are going to lead us, but um, can you sing that again? Yeah. It's really practical, but we're going to go there, guys. Joy in his presence, joy in his presence, joy in his presence today. I want you to get on that snare, bro. Joy in his presence, there we go. Joy in his presence, joy in his presence Just sing today. that, sing that to the Lord. Joy in his presence. Sing it, joy, joy. Keep singing it. There's joy today. Keep singing that. I want you guys to begin to jump slow. Let yourself go there. Let yourself. Oh, get a little louder. There's joy. Just the drums, just the drums, keep singing this joy. Joy in his presence. Just the drums. We're gonna keep going. Alright, just the voices, joy. Joy in his presence. Just the voices. Let yourself go there, guys. There's something here. Thank you, Lord. Joy in his presence today. Thank you, Lord. Keep singing it. Joy. Joy in his presence. Joy in his presence. There's faith. There's faith. Lord, you're refreshing us. You're refreshing us with joy. Joy. Joy in his presence. Joy in his presence. Keep going. Okay, now get on that snare. Just the snare. Here we go. Joy. Joy in his presence. Yeah. That is called faith. Do you feel your heart begin to want to respond to that? He's authoring faith. Come on. This is good, guys. I'm going to ask the singers to really go there. Whatever comes in your heart in this place, just begin to sing it from joy. We're going to go there together. He's teaching us something. Joy in his presence. Joy in his presence. Joy in his presence. Yes. You've got to prophesy yes. when your dance moves. You 
And then go back to that chorus. There's joy. There's joy. I'm going to ask the band, just take it. Take it. Take this song. Take it. Joy. Joy in his presence. 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 Take it, take it. Joy, there's joy, there's joy, there's joy. Yes.
past is yet to come. The best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. I want to be found singing. The best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. I want to be found singing, dancing in the joy. I want to be found dancing, singing in the joy.
that you are the holy and anointed, the risen and exalted King of heaven, and that there is no one like you in heaven or on earth, that you are perfect. with joy, you come with tears, you come with healing, you come like fire, you come like rain, like wind, like oil, and you move on your people. So Spirit, we just honor you in this place, and we just submit to the leadership of the Spirit right now. submit to his hand, to the moving of his spirit, to his heartbeat. When we say we won't take one more step unless we hear your voice, because we can do nothing apart from you. So come on, just as we close, even in your own heart, just say, I submit to you, spirit, wherever you're calling me wherever you're calling my church, my ministry, my own life, my family. We just submit to your leadership. No one can do it like you. No amount of singing or dancing can compare to a move of the Holy Spirit. sending your son and sending us your spirit. And we just honor you right now in every way that we can with our broken words and our songs. We just honor you because you alone are worthy. In your name, amen. Every year for the last 23 years, I have gotten away as a senior pastor, gone up north and sought God's face with prayer, fasting, listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit about what he wanted to accomplish in Radiant Church over the next year and season. It's become part of my natural rhythm of ministry to get away from the hustle, the bustle, to get away from board meetings, to get away from all the lists and the tasks that are waiting for me, and to really put my ear to the heart of God and say, God, what are you saying? But what I want to do is invite you to come along with me to do that very thing this fall. 
We're going to go up north to a retreat center called Crystal Mountain. In our morning sessions, we're just going to have stripped down worship, meals together, and devotional from Sonny and myself. And then you're going to have the whole afternoon to walk these beautiful grounds, smell the fall air, walk in the crisp leaves, go down trails, listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit, journal for yourself, hear what God is saying. And I'm going to take a few sessions and just share with you my process of hearing from God, how I pray. And I think it's going to change radically the way that we do ministry and encourage you greatly. It's life-changing. Your ministry, your heart will never be the same again. We hope that you'll join us. And so we want to invite you uh, to join us on that. Uh, if you're a network pastor, uh, senior leader of your church. Uh, it's just a powerful time of just getting away, building relationships, and we hope that you'll join us and be a part of that. Uh, how many have just enjoyed the sweetness of the presence of the Lord in this whole conference? It's, for me, it's been so refreshing and uh, renewing, and uh, I'm really, really glad that we were able this year to gather uh, even if it's online for a lot of us, but just to be together has just been so rich. And we want to let you know that next year, uh, you know, unless Jesus comes, <laughs> we're, we're planning on being here next year. And we're uh, proud to announce who our, our, uh, our different ministers who are going to be. John Tyson from uh, Church in the City of New York. If you don't know John, John's become a friend of mine. He was born in Australia uh, he has immigrated, been a part uh, of the Manhattan area, and planted multiple churches in uh, Manhattan, is leading an incredible, thriving church there. And uh, he was just on Q Cultural, uh, the Cultural Summit with Gabe Lyons in Nashville, Tennessee. He is, he's an eclectic guy. I mean, he's a scholar, he's a theologian, he was mentored under Timothy Keller, and he's a uh, a student of revival. So we've invited him to come, and Corey Russell is going to be with us as well. And so those two are friends. All three of us are kind of friends, so it, it, it could get crazy next year. So uh, we're excited to have them next year. So please plan on coming and being a part of that uh, with us next year. And uh, one, one quick thing, I want to throw this in as well. If you, if you would join us in intercession and prayer for two particular areas of the globe where we have great friends and ministries that right now are enduring some incredible persecution and intense times right now. One is the nation of Myanmar. Uh, you may have seen them on the news. Myanmar is uh, under in the midst of a military coup uh, where they are just coming down hard, 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 especially on Christians and those from the Chin uh, state. And we have a, an orphanage and a ministry that we work with uh, that's like family to us that uh, has, so far, uh, God has just sovereignly protected them, uh, but they have now begun to crack down in the particular city that they're in, in Yangon, uh, on Christian orphanages. And so uh, the person that we, were, that we work with, her name is Esther, she's been here at our church. She got a phone call on her phone, cell phone, from the military saying, we're coming for you. And so they've hid the kids, uh, they're in hiding, and then the internet shut down, and that was the last communication our contacts had with them. So if you would, just have them on your heart and be praying for Bethlehem Home. The second area that we're praying for devoutly is India, because our dear friend, Brother Abraham, and the New India Church of God and planted 6,000 churches across uh, India. Uh, they are in the middle of just... Uh, uh, a sweeping, the, the pandemic there is on a, just, it's like burning through India right now. At the same time, the government is really cracking down. So those are dear friends, and when I was worshiping and we were just talking about King Jesus, you know, the thing that we have in common with believers all over, all over the world is we have one king. And as I was singing about that, that our allegiance to Jesus, I was just thinking about the people that I love that are in other places of the world that right now are, are paying a dear price for their faith. And what a privilege we have right here of being able to gather like this and worship. Even if it's a little, uh, you know, a little bit different, a little bit strained, we still have that freedom. And I'm so grateful for that. So please be in prayer uh, for them. And uh, I don't know if last session, 
begin to just prime the pump in your heart for what God has done and what he wants to do. But I'm excited in this session to continue that conversation. So would you help welcome Dr. Michael Brown as he joins me up on the platform. Hey, Tim. Hey, Tim, would you grab that microphone for Dr. Brown there? Awesome. And uh, just so that you know, in uh, a little bit, at the end of this, it's that chair again. Uh, at the end of this session, uh, Dr. Brown is going to be beelining it for the airport so that he can get home uh, tonight. And uh, again, we just want to say uh, thank you so much for coming to Kalamazoo and being a part of Arise Shine this year. It's been a joy. Appreciate and it. It's been incredible. What you guys didn't have, uh, I, I just had one of the great joys of my life. I had an hour and a half uh, deep dive conversation with Dr. Brown back in my office, and uh, man, the gold. I wish I could have just recorded that and uh, just hit play, and you could have made your plane a whole lot easier. Uh, but uh, we're, we're so grateful to have you here, and uh, thank you for the years of service to the church. Thank you for what you continue to do through your writing and through your daily radio program and, and traveling and speaking. Uh, you're an inspiration, and uh, I, I really believe in the in honor. Uh, and one of the things that has been stripped away from our culture, I believe, is honor uh, and recognizing the value and the wisdom of fathers in our culture. And uh, you, sir, are a father in the body of Christ, and we honor you, and we respect you, and we're so grateful for you. Thank you so, so much. Thank you so much. <clears throat> So one of the things I wanted to ask you this afternoon uh, was how is it that a Jewish boy uh, who got involved in drug, sex, and rock and roll ended up being a uh, ancient language scholar who's an apologist, uh, leading apologist to reach Jewish people uh, in the world and also an expert on revival history? How in the world did that happen? Yeah, so, okay, the, the short story is, uh, you know, the whole drug rock scene that was just a product of the, of the times. So when I got bar mitzvah at the age of 13, it was 1968. And it was because we were not religious Jews, it was, it was like nominal church and you get confirmed. That's how it was, but it was more of a social event. The big event for me was, was my first rock concert seeing Jimi Hendrix when I was 13 and just getting caught up in the whole scene, the rebellion and the drugs, you know, just, so I started getting high at 14 and, and shooting heroin by the time I was 15, just kind of plunged in. So my two best friends, uh, we played in a band together and we thought we were gonna be this great rock band and all of this, we were just teenagers and uh, the guys liked these two girls and these two girls had an uncle who was a pastor and a dad had been praying for them. The dad got saved after he got married so the mom wasn't a believer, but the dad was. So little by little, they started going to the church. And then, uh, because it was Pentecostal, it was interesting. You know, it talked about tongues and yeah. demons. And, and the pastor taught a lot about end time prophecy from the book of Revelation. So I li literally, I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. My friends would come home from a service and we'd be sitting around getting high and they'd be telling me what they heard in church. And they'd say, you know, there's gonna be a beast seven heads, <laughs> 10 horns. It's going to kind of a bottomless pit. So we're on drugs hallucinating. Dude. And they're, it's like, that's in the Bible, Bro. man. Right. So, so literally, this is what would happen. So what happened was little by little, God started working in their lives and they got wonderfully saved. And um, then, you know, now it was separating us because I was, you know, decadent and plunging deeper into drugs and stuff. So I decided I'd go to the church to pull them out, you know, and just show them the whole thing was stupid and silly. And when I first went, one of the young ladies who knew me from high school wrote down in her diary, Antichrist comes to church. That was, and, and my wife, Nancy, we didn't know each other then. We didn't meet till we were 19, but she saw a picture of me in the old hippie days and started laughing. This is years later. And I said, you're laughing because I look like a woman. She said, no, I'm laughing because you look like an ugly woman. <laughs> so. That was me, Antichrist with long hair, ugly woman. And um, the people started praying for me n with me not knowing that at all. The Holy Spirit started to bring me under conviction and I got wonderfully radically born again by the end of the year. 
Well, what happened was my dad said, when he saw I was serious about this, and he said, Michael, it's great that you're off drugs, but we're Jews, we don't believe in this. So he brought me to meet the local rabbi, brilliant young man, fresh out of seminary, he's about 11 years older than me, and he began to challenge me intellectually, and, and you know, I was studying the scripture and you know, memorizing, but it was, it was all in English. So he challenged me, you know, if you, how can you teach us what to believe? You can't even read Hebrew. And I'd go and meet with these rabbis, I mean, learned rabbis, and they've, they've been studying since they were little kids. And I'd quote my verses in English, saying, oh, those translations are terrible. And, and so I was really forced to learn Hebrew because the little I learned from my bar mitzvah was, it was nothing, you know, just nothing at all. So I started in college taking Hebrew classes, but they were modern Hebrew, and I wanted to learn biblical. So I, I taught myself biblical Hebrew and then thought, you know, I should probably learn some of the other languages that, from the ancient world. And that, that's what led to my doctorate in Semitic languages. You know, I just initially wanted to be able to answer the rabbis. So you didn't grow up like going to Jewish school where you memorized. I thought that maybe that's where you learned Hebrew. You, no, you did the, it later. the little here, this was how, how shallow it was. So when you're bar mitzvah, you chant a, a passage from the Hebrew Bible. Right, and, and you learn, you know, you, you kind of memorize it and chant it, you know, the rabbi works with you on it, right? So I didn't even know what I was reading. It was just, no one bothered to even suggest that I read in English what it meant. It was just the ritual of reading the Hebrew. So by the time I went to college, I remember the first day of classes, I thought I had an advantage because I remembered some of the alphabet. That was it. Next day I was level with everybody. Yes, yeah, so it was just, in college, and, and then I kind of went overboard. I started taking more languages. So I, while in college, I studied Hebrew, Arabic, Latin, Greek, German, and Yiddish, which is just not the best thing to learn like six new languages at the I same struggled time. struggled with English. Yeah, was... so, and then at that point, two things were happening. One, there was a call of God on my life to study these things and, and to have the academic background. So I went on to grad school, that was the next thing. But the other thing was that I started to get really kind of obsessed with it. That's why God had to deal with me in the, in the late 70s, early 80s that I'd left my first love. You know, the scholarship became an idol instead of a tool. But that's how I got on that challenge by the rabbis and wanted to be able to read it on my own and not have to find out what a dictionary said or a commentary said. And then, you know, the revival part was I, I got dramatically saved. Right. And then I experienced an outpouring in my own life that you know, God sent through me to our church in 82, 83. So that became a consuming thing, you know? And, and when I got to Brownsville, that confirmed everything I'd always believed. Mm -hmm. I really believed that if, if we preach the real gospel message without compromise and, and really lifted up Jesus and let the Holy Spirit move, that people would come flocking. And that's, that's what happened. Yeah. I, when you showed that video uh, in your first session, it was amazing to me, even though that's been, I don't know, 20, 20 almost 25 years. Uh, and, you know, it's a grainy video, and uh, your, your hair was much darker uh, in the 90s. I think all of us probably feel that way. Uh, Some, but, someone born here in the yeah, 90s. How many of you weren't even born in 1996? Raise your hand. You, oh, my goodness. Now I feel old. That's great. Thank you. Uh, but the thing that stood out to me was even through a grainy video in a, you know, a snippet of something like that, there's still a, a I don't know if it's a transfer uh, anointing or you can feel it. And it actually stirs something within yeah. you, even across time and decades and, you know, even culture and technology. There's still something on it that almost becomes uh, you start feeling it. It's almost like you, you can smell it, you can feel it. Uh, what do you think that is? Even we were talking earlier about testimonies and the power yeah. of testimony when it comes to revivals. So it's, there are a couple of things. One, reading revival books, which many of us did, stirred us. You'd read the account and you'd be gripped with the reality of it. You think, well, why can't this happen now? You'd read things and they were so authentic. You know, you could tell them, this is not hype, this really happened. You think, well, why isn't it happening here? Something doesn't seem to be lining up. So there's that reminder of what God did. Look, the scriptures repeat things over and over and over, and, and children of Israel would recount them in their psalms and things. There's something to that. And that 
um, the power of testimony that we were talking about, like we, we saw outwardly people seeking God and some weeping and worshiping, but we don't know what's going on in individual hearts, right? Yeah. And it could be that you get back to your local congregation and suddenly the spirit breaks out and all these dramatic things happen or you were, you were amazingly healed of some condition you've had for years. You don't know it until someone starts to share it. So the sharing of the thing, this is a way of sharing a testimony by showing the video. But there is, you know, there is a real anointing, just like you can read an old Finney sermon and get convicted by it today. It's not just the words, but the spirit anoints it. So, uh, you know, this has been a pattern for, for decades. Once there have been videos of things that, that people have shown them and the spirit's fallen dramatically. And I've, I've had it, remember years, years back, um, hang on, it was, I remember it was October 13th of 96. I was scheduled to, uh, to speak Sunday morning, Sunday night for a friend of mine with a thriving church on Long Island. So I was in Pensacola and I was gonna have to leave, fly out um, Saturday night, which would be a rare thing to be there for Sunday morning. And uh, Pastor Kilpatrick said, Mike, I'm exhausted. I need a break. Could you preach for me Sunday morning? And I said, uh, I, I've got, it's an old friend. It's a student of mine. I've got a, he said, well, see if he'll release you for, so I called. He said, that's good. I'll take Sunday morning. You be, be there for Sunday night. He said, but only on the condition that you pray for me Sunday morning at the church, that you pray for a church. Okay, great. So that Saturday night was one of the most, Sorry. One of the most sacred services I'd ever been in, where the spirit fell dramatically on the young people. And, and after the power of God just fell in like a wave, just swept them down, then the intercession broke out and wailing for, for the schools. And uh, I remember, you know, Steve and I talking. It's like, we don't have to read about revival. You know, we're experiencing it. So I, I, I asked the video team, can you get me a copy of that video tonight? I want to take it with me. So, you know, I, uh, I preached Sunday morning and had to run like, here straight to the airport, fly out to the island, get out ready to preach at night. And uh, I shared for a while. I said, let me just show you a video of what happened last night. That was it. That was it. The spirit just broke out. Just watching the same anointing, same presence and that that often happens, you know, it's because the spirit is timeless, right? The Holy Spirit is here right. and he was there the same way. And there's just something about the, the reality of his presence at that time that you can feel when you, when you watch it. It's like that scripture that says the, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And I think sometimes when we hear a testimony or see a testimony, it becomes a, a, a prophetic tipping point yeah. For us to be able to step into that because we see what's possible. Yes. Or we see somebody else encountering or read about. I mean, I've, I've spent my life reading uh, books on revival because it was fed into me by a youth pastor. And, you know, reading stories like lectures on, on revival by Charles Finney or uh, things even from the first great awakening. And you read those things and you just try and imagine in your in your mind and in your heart, what must that have been like to hear Jonathan Edwards preach a message, sinners in the hands of an angry God, you know, and conviction sweeps over the whole Northampton Congregational Church. And you could at one point go there and they would talk about how the, the pews, there were nail, uh, nail marks scratched into the pews because people, as they were hearing it, were under such heavy conviction. You just think, what was that like? Well, now we live in a technological age. Right. You can actually see that. And... I, I, it just feels like you step into the room. You step into the room in that moment. Yeah, and, and that's one of the things about the reality of revival. As I, as I mentioned, one example or a couple examples, people dramatically touched when they left. You know, one pastor drove across Florida because you could go driving, I think, from Miami to Pensacola. It's like an 11-hour drive. We were right on the border of Alabama. So this pastor drives across Florida, and the church is praying for him because he's going to Brownsville. And as he said, they were expecting him to have like revival in his back pocket. Mm. And uh, so he's sharing the story with us at I think a, a pastor's uh, conference. And uh, he, he's there the whole week, feels nothing, doesn't experience anything. And now he has to go back. He's driving back and he's gonna preach Sunday morning. So he's driving back Saturday. So I guess he was there Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, whatever. He can't even get a message. He's desperate. Mm. 
So he gets to the church building early on Sunday because he doesn't even have a message. And he's knowing there's gonna be this great anticipation. So he's in his study praying and crying out to God during Sunday school and choir practice. And his wife says, honey, I think you need to come and see what's happening. And the spirit had fallen. Here he didn't think he experienced anything. And people had broken down spontaneously, repenting and confessing sin. And um, so the service starts, people coming in, and it's like, what's going on? You got people weeping and confessing. So in his words, he thought he needed to do something clerical, kind of like officially sanction right. what God was doing. Right. He stood to his feet and fell flat on his face, <laughs> hit by the power of God. Only then, only then. And he said, you know, we haven't seen a harvest yet, but we're going through this tremendous cleansing. And so we hear that over and over. And, and, and towards the end, as, as revival started to wane and, and some of the shift just went to what was coming out of the school, we didn't hear those testimonies as much. You know, people would send us pictures and here's the youth group and they stopped at the gas station on the way home, two vans, and they got out to stretch and there are these bodies just all over the, you know, the parking lot. Steve Hill used to tell people, if you're driving out, we don't have speed bumps in the parking lot, so if you hit something, stop, because it could just be someone literally just collapsed. And, but many times they didn't feel anything during the service. And then you say, well, what happened after that? That's the issue. In other words, the falling, the shaking, that was completely immaterial. It was lives changed, mm. dramatically changed, deep repentance. I was ministering at a, a conference, a small group of charismatic leaders from an eclectic background a few years ago, and a couple wants to share a story with me. They, uh, they tell, us, tell me about, it was either their son or their friend's son. I forget that detail, but what I remember was they lived halfway across the country. Their son was a drug addict, hopelessly addicted. And um, they, they threw him in the back car. He was unconscious. He was so out on drugs. Threw him in the back seat, let him sleep, and drove across the country. Got him to Pensacola for one service where he was instantly saved, set free, went back home, and started a drug rehab ministry. Wow. And it was years later, and I'm here for the first time. I'm in California. Hang on. It was, it was immediately after Trump was elected. So, so 2016... And interestingly, it was two congregations coming together, one basically all white and the other basically all Hispanic. And they said, we'd like you to talk about the elections. Oh, great, <laughs> that'd be an easy one, right? California. Yeah. But anyway, it was just a kingdom message, of course. Anyway, the pastor tells me a story I'd never heard. Youth pastor from his church brings about 30 kids to Pensacola with him. And you know what, generally when kids get touched, it's real. Yeah. You know, they're, they're not, I mean, kids can put on an act, but you don't wanna be different and cast out. And in the earliest days of revival, some of the worst kids in the schools there, you know, gangs and dysfunctional and bad students and all that, on drugs and sleeping around, they come, they get dramatically touched, now they go back to school, and during class, the spirit would fall on them. I mean, they literally would fall on the ground and no one knew what was going on, and they couldn't talk. And the, they nurse, they'd bring them to the nurse's office, and sometimes just get one word out of them, Brownsville. So they all, the, the, in Pensacola, the youth pastor, Richard Crisco, then knew the schools. He could get into, sit any of the schools and hang out with the kids during lunch. And uh, so they realized what was, they put two and two together, and they called him angry, like, what is going on? Until the kids started changing. And they would see the, like the, the worst kid in the yeah. class now on fire and like class leader. I had the superintendent of schools tell me about how the kids were impacted. When I asked him, I interviewed him in the fall of 97. And, and he said, well, I can tell you firsthand, I was principal in one of the schools, I can tell you what happened. Yeah. So this youth pastor brings, uh, so I'm hearing this in 2016 for the first time, brings maybe 25, 30 kids down from the church and they all get touched by the power of God so they're on the plane, flying out of Pensacola, and they're all shaking. Now you're trying, to, you're on the plane, you know, you're at the airport, you're trying at this point to just act kind of composed, and you know, and they're all sitting there kind of shaking on the plane. So the one lady's talking to the youth pastor, doesn't know who he was. So she goes, oh, so what do you do? He goes, oh, I, I brought a bunch of uh, young people down to some meetings here, and she looks around, and she goes, that is so kind of you to care for these special needs kids. <laughs> 
So, I mean, you hear that, but then you hear what happens after. Right. And they're on the mission field. Yeah, and that's the you know, fruit. But, yeah, I that, think, that was yeah, that was normal <laughs> life. That's, and I think that's important because uh, oftentimes we can get obsessed or the church can get obsessed with what takes place in the four walls of meetings. And we can begin to associate revival with services and even manifestations. And those things are real. They happen in every awakening and every revival. But the fruit of a revival, I, I think a true revival should have fruit that validates the actual revival. It's not what happens when you fall on the ground, but what happens when you get up and you walk out yeah. the back door. I mean, I'd say that almost every week. You know, we don't care if you fall and shake. The question is, how are you living when you walk out of here? And then Steve Hill used to say, the true test of an evangelist ministry is five or 10 years down the line. Wow. So we would have all the critics and the skeptics because, you know, you, you can have controversy without revival, but you can't have revival without controversy. Yeah. And, and, and um, Arthur Wallace in his book, In the Day of Thy Power, says if something claims to be a revival and it's not spoken against, check again to see if it's really a revival. Wow. So it will happen no matter how godly and scriptural you are. It's going to attract controversy and criticism. And, and the critics would say, well, nothing's really happening or it's the same people over and over at the altar. They're not really getting saved. You don't believe the numbers. And it's like, okay, what do you say now 25 years later? Yeah. What do you say of the, the, the people that you can talk to to this day? I, I got a call a few months ago on the, my radio show, and it was a, a gal saying that she came to revival with kids from her youth group, and they were about 13, you know, a bunch of, a bunch of the young ladies she was friends with, and she said they were all, th that was the turning point in their lives. Mm. That's 13 years old. That's yeah, fruit. And she's talking about what happened in her own life. So that's, of course, you're going to have people at backslide. That always happens. Yeah. You know, Jonathan Edwards talked about the excesses and so on. But, but one revival historian pointed out that the chief critic of the day was Charles Chauncey. He was Edwards' chief critic. And some speculated that his anti-revival books sold more than Jonathan Edwards' books back then. Wow. Of course, no one knows Chauncey's name today unless you're a church historian, right? But this, this, this church historian pointed out that whereas Chauncey focused on the chaff, Edwards focused on the wheat. Yeah. And, and that was one of his points, that, that you cannot reject the whole because of an aberration here and there. Yeah. And that's what you look at, the fruit of the it's change so lies, believers changed. And that was the, in order, the, the largest number of people changed were believers who got on fire. Mm. The next number was backsliders who were away and came back to God. And, and then fresh converts, first time converts. One story we heard when the woman became a member of the church, she was driving by the building, a non-believer, no thought of God on her mind whatsoever, lived in the neighborhood, and suddenly the spirit fell in her car. She, driving by the building, became overwhelmingly aware of her sin, began to weep under conviction, and got born again in her car driving by the building. And we heard the testimony when she became a member of the church. That's amazing. It's amazing. Uh, we were talking earlier about... Uh, the election. We were talking about uh, 2020 and all that has gone on. And, uh, you know, it seems like uh, 2020 was the longest decade of all of our lives. You know, it was like uh, so much happened in a, in a year. I would love for you to talk about not so much from a natural perspective, you know, the political, there was the, uh, the social uh, justice component of things. There was the election component of things. But I'm really curious about what do you see, both the positive and maybe the negative, uh, that God is doing and saying to the church in this last season? Because obviously, in, in the middle of all this, God's not taking a vacation, right? He's speaking and he's using right. and he's positioning us. What, do you, what have you felt over the, the course of, let's just say, the last 18 months that God is highlighting and doing in the church? Yeah, I believe in many ways he's really shown us um, he's, he's revealed a lot of our weakness and, and sin and flesh. Regardless of where we stood on the elections, most of us got pretty obsessed and, and focused in a way that would be very unhealthy. And a lot of our Facebook pages or social media pages, wherever you are, social media feeds seem to be Jesus and politics were now completely one. And we were better known for what candidate we supported than as followers of Jesus. And, and uh, 
I, I believe God used that. Obviously, elections are important, and, and you know, we vote and we're involved in the political process. But I believe that God's been using that to show us how much we were putting our trust in a system or a person, whatever, uh, and, and how quickly we became very, very carnal. You know, the children of Israel, Ten Commandments, it's only a few weeks later they build the golden calf. I mean, the, they violate the first commandment. It's kind of shocking how carnal some of us could become. And I remember one night um, just looking at some posts from old friends, and, and I didn't know that Nancy, uh, I was in one part of the house, Nancy in another part of the house, so I texted her. And I said, you know, are you up? Because I, I didn't want to just, you know, yell through, I, just the two of us in the house, you know, just, are, are you up? It's a big house. Yeah, but, but e either way, you could just be in separate rooms, and yeah. if she was asleep already, I didn't want to, you know, and yeah. so, you still up? Yeah, so, where are you? So she's down, uh, downstairs, and, and I was upstairs, so I went down, and, and uh, she was sitting on the couch, and I, I just lost it. I, I didn't expect it to hit me like that. And I just said, what's become of us? I started weeping. I remember she was just, you know, just put my head, my head fell on her knees. I just started sobbing and controlling. I said, what's happened to us? It's just like we got obsessed with things and, 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 and lost our focus. I, I also believe that, that with, with COVID, the, the goal was not to get through this to go back to church as normal. Because mm -hmm. church as normal wasn't cutting it. And thank God you have thriving congregations like yours, and I'm sure others here with great testimonies of what God's doing, but in so many ways, we're just dependent on a meeting, being in a building, instead of being the church and the community. So I, I look at it as a tremendous opportunity at a time when America is going through more uncertainty and shaking than any time in our memory, even living through the 60s, you know, there's a saying, some of you will relate to if you're old enough, if you remember the 60s, you weren't there. <laughs> I wasn't there. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, there's no that delayed, and then the older one's like, yeah, yeah, I understand that. But even the tumultuous 60s and Talk 60s. Talk about that. Tie the, the conditions of the 60s yeah, in. So it's maybe what you, you see now. You have the, the post-World War II years, and now a lot of stability, uh, couples marrying and now having kids. So you have suddenly the baby boomer generation that you have a, a larger number of young people coming into the society in a shorter period of time, which sociologists will tell you creates upheaval. Because young people are you know, partying more and rebelling more, and especially young men fighting more and stuff like that. So when you have this disproportionate surge of youth, it, it can bring an instability to society. And then a whole bunch of things happen in a short period of time. Birth control pill was introduced in 1960. So it's, it's not a lot of fanfare, but suddenly sex is more for recreation than procreation. And you, you, you make this separate, it's a lot easier. Women can make choices now. It's a lot easier for them to say, hey, we do this or that. Um, 62 organized public prayer is removed from schools. So many schools in America, there would just be a 22-word prayer for the nation and teachers. It's generic to God. Uh, I didn't grow up with that in New York, but many parts of the country it was there. Supreme Court rules against that. To me, that was more a symbolic thing. 63 organized uh, public Bible reading is removed because they would read over the intercom in schools, in, in many schools. That's banned. Again, to me, that was more symbolic than anything. Um, 63, the March on Washington, civil rights movement rising. Martin Luther King's famous I Have a Dream speech. Uh, I've read that JFK didn't know what would happen and if it they, they had ready, uh, on the ready, you know, contingencies of soldiers in case something happened and if King's speech became too incendiary, they're ready to cut the power. Of course, it was quite the opposite. It's a major historic moment in a positive way. But that shook a lot of the status quo in the nation because we were a far different country then. Yeah you know, with segregation and all of that. And then 63 Kennedy's assassinated. So it, it, was, it was before cell phones, obviously decades before that, or everything instant on TV, but we got to see that. You know, the, they had film, he's, he's there in this open vehicle, and I remember the announcement in school, the president's been assassinated. So kids just started crying, you, know, you don't know what to do, and the parents come to pick you, you know, your school ended early, and, and uh, uh, 
and then we'd watch on, you know, you'd watch on TV and the footage, and there's the camera, the you know, they don't know what to do, and the guy's like, oh no, what's happened? So that brought a certain sense of instability uh, when that happens. 64, what was the, the big event, big cultural event of 64 watched by over half of America? Beatles. Beatles on Ed Sullivan. Go look it up online. You will never see anything more tame. These guys in their silly suits with their hair, it was considered long hair then, breaking the rules. Look at the girls in the audience in their dresses crying. And oh, that was a major cultural moment. Uh, and, and then with that, it seems so innocent, but within a few years, they're singing, it goes from, I want to hold your hand to why don't we do it in the road? I mean, literally, that was one of their songs. And, and they're, they're singing Revolution, and their hair is longer, and they're, they're, all, they're all experimenting with drugs, and now they've gone to India, and now they've brought back Eastern religion. Right. You know, it was a fad. <laughs> if they did it, I mean, it, massive fads. And, um, so within a couple of years, if you see 65, the Beatles on Ed Sullivan, uh, excuse me, at Shea Stadium in New York. So just look at Beatles, Shea Stadium. Ed Sullivan, in his jacket and tie, introduces them. And, and the play, it's pandemonium. The girls, but still in dresses, looking very conservative, screaming, crying, and the parents there with them at the concert, right? To go fast forward two years, two years, Monterey Pop, the first major rock festival. There had been jazz festivals, first major rock festival. It, it was so visionary and so anti-materialistic that any of the bands playing had to play without getting paid, just their expenses covered. And any profits made would be given to Native Americans. I mean, this is like the, the dream of it. We were looking for a better world and a better life and pushing back against the, the, the American commercialism and the, the American dream and all of that. And um, you watch the footage. I mean, the Who singing in my generation and then smashing their equipment at the end of it. You have you know, the, the, the light show. I was saying similar to what you have here. It's actually more psychedelic, you know, the pulsing images and you're high on drugs watching this. Jimi Hendrix finishes his, he's got to up it on the who. He sets his guitar on fire, destroys it. It's, I mean, it's a vulgar act when you, when you see it. It's just two years later from, from, from Shea Stadium and the Beatles to this. It's, it's almost unimaginable. And, and then one year later, 68 is the year of massive upheaval. That's the year even around the world of major shifts. 68, you have the May Revolution in France where student uprising and others, it almost overthrows the government of Charles, of Charles de Gaulle. You, you have um, so, Soviet Union advances, you know, the, yeah. it, it, things like that happening, more unsettlement. You're in the midst now of the Cultural Revolution in China, getting rid of the old ways and, and, and young people just getting rid of the elders, I mean, violently and stuff. By 68, you have a massacre in Mexico, a Tlatelico massacre. Uh, and, and as a result of that, just kind of a, it now spreads from students now across the nation. When I was in Mexico some years ago, I asked them, was there a shift in your culture in the 60s? I said, oh yeah, 68. I said, what happened? He said, that's when we stopped trusting the government. We had a massacre and so on. And when I started asking around the world, I get the same answer, oh, 68. In Germany, uh, 68, they call it the 68 generation, when things shifted. So in America, uh, that's when Martin Luther King was killed. So, uh, okay, we've, we've seen the horror of, of, of watching uh, uh, George Floyd die, and, and you see the impact on the nation and the, and the protests and the, and the riots and things like that. Think about Martin Luther King being assassinated. I mean, you're, you're talking about the, the civil rights leader of the day and highly respected and killed by a white man, so riots break out in cities all over America. Yeah. Uh, and, and then the, the, the hope, the, the guy that so many liberal Americans and, and those passionate for civil rights, the hope of the nation now is Robert F. Kennedy, then he gets assassinated. So you're watching this happen, this tremendous upheaval, and the backdrop to all this, the Vietnam War, and, and it's mandatory draft, you turn 18, you get drafted, and you go over there, and friends are dying, and for what? And there was, there was the, um, increasing lack of support for the war in the nation. So you come back as a veteran rejected by your country. You, you are now the enemy. So you got this going on and young people are like, what are we fighting for? What's going on? And then explodes from 68 into 69, Woodstock. You look at Woodstock, that's just 
four years after the Beatles at Chase Stadium. And you got a half million people there. And I would look at footage and weep because I, you, you remember there was a hunger there where we would literally sit around and get high and talk about spiritual things every single day. That's all you ever talked about. It was existence of God or which religion is true or is there life after? What about the spirit realm? So there was a hunger in that generation for something. And there was a, there were, we were questioning. You, you ask your dad, dad, why do you push me so hard in school? Hmm. So you can get into the best college. Why do I want to get into the best college? Well, so you can get the best job. Dad, why do I need the best job? So you can put your kid in the best school. So they can go to the best college. So they can get the, and we start saying, is that it? Is that, is that all there is? <clears throat> You know, these hippie communes, we're going to peace, love, man. You know, the older generation saying, America, love her to leave it. We're saying, peace, man. Make love, not war. John Lennon's declaring, you know, if you can declare war, why not declare peace? And he writes a song, Give Peace a Chance. He had two big songs, John Lennon's Give Peace a Chance and, and Country Joe and the Fish, Fixing Like I'm Gonna Die Rag, which used to start with the fish chant, give me an F-I-S. By the time I got to Woodstock, it was a different F chant. Yeah. But if, if, you, if you look at the lyrics to that, here's Country Joe singing that in front of a half million people because the tra traffic was so intense that people couldn't get in, to, so they just had to get some to, to perform. So he gets up without his band, just with his guitar, and you got a half million people singing the song with him, and they said that about his song and Lennon's song, you wrote the song that stopped the war. And I mean, it's, it's real intense lyrics. You know, be the first one on your block to have your boy come home in a box. And, you know, it's just really yeah. biting. So there's the pushing back, the massive generation gap. Woodstock in 69, uh, these different radical feminist groups rising up. W one was called, had the acronym WITCH. Yeah, it, it was Women's International Conspiracy from Hell. It, and that was the acronym WITCH. I got one letter wrong, but this was what they actually named themselves, radical feminists. And then you had Stonewall Riots, that some of the backdrop the gay community had basically had it with being pushed down. There were these transvestite prostitutes that would be commonly arrested at the Stonewall, Stonewall Inn, you know, the bar there, and they just kind of had it. And interestingly, according to some gay historians, Judy Garland had just died and she was like, you know, suicide. She was an icon in the gay community. So many of the men were emotionally wrought up over her death when the cops raided the bar again and in the process arrested, you know, and it was, it was mafia, other things related, they were raiding the bar, but some of them decided enough is enough and they fought back and next thing they're setting the place on fire and throwing bricks at the police cars and that's, you know, Stonewall riots, which have become now like a great part of American history. Yeah. You know, if you remember President Obama's second inauguration speech, he, he celebrated uh, Seneca, Selma and Stonewall, three great moments in American history. So Seneca, the women's rights, Selma, civil rights, and Stonewall gay rights. So, yeah. you know, that's the shift in the culture. But all this happened, and, and then everything looked different. Within a few years, everything looked different. I remember in the schools, you know, the girls were in these dresses, and the guys like these regular slacks, and now everyone's wearing jeans, and the girls were looking, you know, like, like prostitutes. I, I remember coming, up, coming to school one day, and there was this one gal with short shorts and fishnet stockings, I didn't remember that outfits like that like a year earlier, just like sh shift it. Yeah. And psychologist David Myers said, if you fell asleep in 1960, woke up in 2000, we just mentioned this, that you'd find the divorce rate doubled, teen suicide tripled, reported violent crime up four times, prison population up five times, children born out of wedlock up six times, people living together out of wedlock up seven times. So just sh massive shift, most of it happened within a few years in the 60s and then the 70s built on that. So when I look at today, uh, we are more divided than we ever were. There was a generation gap back then, but the divisions across the nation, in so many ways, I've never seen us this divided. It, it may be a little less vocal. Without President Trump, you know, there, the conflict was maybe in the news more every day, right. but, it's, the, but the, it's the, the divisions are just as deep. The sense of uncertainty, pessimism, even about the future. And here you have the older generation and the church looking at what's happening with us hippies, rebels. So we are just sinners, rebels doing evil, right? And all the prophecies are lining up. Jesus is coming any moment. This must be the final rebellion. 
most of the churches missed the spiritual seeking, mm. missed the fact that we were asking questions and looking for more. So we have to turn around with the younger generation instead of just seeing the extremism and, and, and some of the shallowness and the positions being taken, say, okay, what, what is it that they're after? You know, the, there's a, a passion for yeah. justice and maybe misguided. There's a passion that wants to see wrongs righted. There, there's, look, even if you think of being on the wrong side of gay marriage, it, for most, it's not just rebellion against the church or rebellion against the stand, status quo. For some, it is. But for many, it's solidarity with the underdog. Right. The, the one that's been rejected or, you know, right. or put out. So that's a positive quality. It lands in the wrong place. Right. You know, just like most of them will be pro-Palestinian because Israel is now the bully. So, right. But it's, it's motivated by something that's often good, but it's landing in the wrong place. Mm. So instead of just pushing away and condemning, we have to figure out how to reach that cry. Even, you know, the whole appeal of Marxism is this utopia. Right. And of course, it does the opposite. It ends up bringing oppression and, and death on, on, you know, incredible, incredible scale. But behind it, there's this desire for something. Uh, my friend in India, Yesu Padam, uh, that I work with, and yeah, confirming the COVID is ravaging the nation, yeah. and some more friends sick right now. But when he was raised an untouchable, so he suffered the worst of the caste system. Uh, he was so weak that he couldn't work, so his, his parents sent him to school. But he would say when kids were getting a drink from the, the fountain, he would have to get down underneath them for anything that dripped through their hands and hopefully try to catch a, something on his tongue. When he did work, he'd, you know, he, he'd go to get his money and the, the rich own, you know, homeowner would say, I don't have any money, come back tomorrow, knowing he couldn't eat. And he'd go two, three days like that. Finally, he was found one day dying on the side of the road. Uh, a Canadian missionary found him, passed out on the side of the road, brought him to the hospital on the edge of death. It was months to rehabilitate him as a boy. But instead of appreciating the missionary, he just hated the caste system all the more. He watched his mother die just because they didn't have medication. He said, simple thing, but a curator. But, but they, they had no money for medication. So when he was 11 years old, he was approached by Naxalites who were radical Maoist communists, violent still very active in India, and uh, took an interest in him personally as an 11-year-old and told him, hey, we're going to fix things. We're going to set, we're going to turn it around. So at the age of 11, he signed with his own blood and became a Naxalite. And by the time he was a, an older teenager, he was engaged in atrocities against the rich. Uh, he became an alcoholic atheist. And then mid to early 20s, Jesus appeared to him. And, you know, he's radically transformed, but he he is one of the great national leaders with, I mean, planted thousands of churches as well, but orphanages and schools, and yeah. to the point the government, the government recognizes and honors him and stuff like that from an untouchable. It's, it's extraordinary. But he, he wanted to be a revolutionary, and he thought it would happen with Marxism. <laughs> and then he got saved. He said, now I know how to be a revolutionary. So yeah. they really, they transform regions. I mean, he's done it in other countries. It's, it's extraordinary to see. So the... We've got to take hold of whatever it is that's good right. that people are after, the heart right. for justice and wanting to see equality. And, but with, with all the junk, the way it's come down from intersection, intersectionality and the, you know, the exaggeration of things, and, you know, so it's, it, it's you know, being woke and all of that. So we, we can't be put off by that. We have to say, okay, there's something you're on to. Yeah, there's something searching. I agree with. Yeah. Here's the answer in Jesus. And here's how we're doing it in our community. And here's how people are coming together across race. And, and here's how we're fixing things that need to be fixed, etc. cetera. So, so there's something out there. Instead of just rejecting it, we, we've got to ask God for wisdom to draw people from there. And yeah, repent of sin. You're guilty. All that. We preach that. It never changes. But something was missed in the 60s. The church basically slept its way through the counterculture revolution. And then sadly, through much of the Jesus people movement. And it, it, it was in April of 1965 that Time Magazine had its first, and it was big then, very influential. It had its first cover story with no picture, just text. First time they ever did it. Three words, is God dead? June of, of 65. And then June of 71. Yeah. It, it, was, it was April of 65, June of 71. 
the Jesus Revolution. Yeah. One of the most stirring articles you can read about what God's doing. Yeah. And yet the church didn't recognize what was happening. And instead of discipling and incorporating yeah. people in and saying, hey, maybe you have a different musical expression. Yeah. Or maybe there's something in your background. When we get you cleaned up and you know, out of sin, maybe there's some perspective you could bring. Instead, it was missed. So the great majority of those who got saved at that time ended up falling away. So if, I, I feel like I just took a grad class on the 60s right there. Sorry. That was, uh, no, that was insane. Uh, I want the transcript of that. <laughs> that. What that does, though, is it paints a panoramic picture of what took place, the cultural shift in America that happened in a, in a couple years. And those of us who have just walked through and are standing in the middle of a very similar shift, yeah. there are lessons to be learned both from the cultural shift and how the church responded to it. Yes. And what we don't want to be as church leaders uh, is we don't want to be in the middle of another shift and miss the window of opportunity. Yeah, exactly. So w what are the things that, if, if you could, because you are, speak to a bunch of church leaders, having the experience of coming out of that and seeing it, what are the things we need to be paying attention to? How would you position the church saying, if we really believe that there's a, another uh, awakening or another cultural awakening that God wants to bring in America. Right. How do we as the church need to prepare ourselves now? Uh, what are the things we need to, uh, to uh, the obstructions we need to remove and what are the foundation stones we need to put into place? Yeah, uh, the very important question to ask. And let me just say this first very briefly. Uh, when I would teach a class on Jesus Revolution every year or two at, at our ministry school, which is now entirely online, I would do something like this, go through the 60s, even give more detail and you know, uh, events, but give the overview, which paints a picture, right? And I said, now let me illustrate it. And I put on, let's watch the Beatles in 64, Beatles in 65, now fast forward to, to uh, Monterey Pop, now fast forward, let's, here's the Beatles now, now fast forward two more years to Woodstock, and, and we'll watch some of the clips and it's, it's not uncommon that after doing it, everybody loses it. They just start weeping because you see like this mass of humanity. Yeah, yeah, the whole sex, drugs, rock and roll, Eastern religion. Yes, that was all going on. I'm not glorifying. It was sin, fully understood. And, and because I'm a drummer, you know, for some reason, I never listened to words. I just, you know, knew the... I just, and I didn't, I didn't hear, you know, even today with singing, I have to listen carefully to hear words if I don't see them. So it was only decades later, I listened to some of those old songs. It's like, oh, I didn't know it was about that. I mean, pretty raunchy songs, but I just, I didn't even know what the words were about. So I'm not, I'm not glorifying any of that. But in the midst of it, I can look in the eyes of the crowds at Woodstock and remember we were looking for something also. So when you actually see it in front of your eyes just in a few years, and went from here to here, it's, it's stunning. It's overwhelming. So a few things that are super obvious and have been obvious for years, obviously, the cry for authenticity and, and the cry for community. I mean, these are things that have been real in the younger generation and, and why a lot of people are just not happy with a, a church service, right? Um, we, we must tell them that the way to really see justice and the way to really see reconciliation and the way to really bring liberation is through Jesus. That, yeah, nothing new in saying that, but, but we have to say you're, you're looking for something and here's where you find it. And here's how we're living it out. And here are examples of it. And to the extent you, you're doing something in the community that you can point to. As my friend Yesu Panam in India, I'm sure the ministry you work with, they don't just plant churches, they, they, they have a tangible effect. On Schools, the, orphanages. Yeah, all that they're widows. doing it. And everyone recognizes. They even send their, their Hindu kids to their schools and things because they recognize you're the ones that are doing it. Yeah. So when we are modeling things in, in a, a multiracial, multiethnic, multigenerational way, uh, and, and, and then recognizing the level of discontent, of fear, of depression that's got to be out there, of anger, and, and, and speak to it honestly. Especially, and then as young people are getting dramatically set free and saved, their testimonies, their stories. Because look, I could get up and talk about gay issues 
and give stats and information and all this, and it can be very compelling, and scripture and theology, and then Billy and Bob can sit here holding hands and talk about the relationship they've had the last 20 years and how they adopted this handicapped Korean kid, and, and here's, they're so proud of him, and, and petting their dog's head as they're talking, and that wins the day. The story wins the day for, for most people, so we have to present these real, life change, transformative stories, and really put hope that, that, you know, as much as you have everything going on publicly in the militancy and all this, you've got, because of social media, a terribly lonely generation. Uh, you know, kids still cutting themselves, why? You know, we weren't doing that in my day. Right. You know, whatever pain it is they're living with, uh, the degree of broken homes, so we, we need to lean into the brokenness that's there. Um, we also need to provide environment to encounter God. I mean, that, in a sense, that's 99% of it. If you can get them in the environment where the Holy Spirit's moving, yeah. that's why young people came flocking to Brownsville. That's why children got transformed, because it's the presence. Yeah. So in that sense, to the degree that our congregations are presence-driven or... or make room for the spirit or, or always are factoring that in. Uh, and, and then one, one last thing that I would add in, so along with recognizing what's happening in the generation, pointing to Jesus as the real way to bring about change, modeling it, testimony, uh, in, encounter. There was one last thing I was gonna say is so profound, it just slipped my mind. <laughs> it was so amazing. <laughs> And profound and incredible. It was going to be like worth just that one saying. So we you, need that. Come yeah, on, yeah. dig it up. Uh, anyway, you you talk. Uh, it'll come to me. Well, it'll I, come back. I, I, the question, <laughs> if it comes to you, just add it in. Yeah, but yeah I, I The will. question I have for you is is seeing, knowing what you've what you've gone through, what you've experienced in history, and knowing kind of the common cultural indicators, things that precede revivals, and knowing where we are today. My question is, are you optimistic? Okay, first I did remember. Okay, go. Yeah. Uh, you first. Okay. Um, we, we must also 100% lean into the degree that LGBT activism, theology, ideology has impacted the younger generation. When God started burdening me in 2004 and showed me that this was going to be the, the issue of the culture, that this was gonna be their principal threat to freedom of religion, speech, and conscience. It seemed crazy. And when people were challenging me, why are you doing this, and why is your ministry focusing on this at all, I tell them, I said, I'm like an umbrella salesman in the desert building more warehouses because I'm telling you, the storm is coming, and you're gonna need these umbrellas. So it wasn't long after that that I started getting asked, could you come and help, we need teaching, we need equipping on this, and, to this day, I mean, I just look at, you know, texts coming in, you know, one guy ministry, okay, we got this thing, kids in our church now have been influenced by the transgender ideology, and how do we impact, how do we influence it, how do we respond, our middle school is confused on this, so here we are, so we need to lean into this, uh, there's a movie that I hosted for American Family Studios, in his image, just jot this down, in his image, dot movie, in his image, dot movie. So you just give your email and then you can, you can watch it for free. In his image, dot movie. Uh, it, it has testimony, powerful transgender, ex-trans, ex-gay, a lot of theology, um, science. It's really well put together. And I was doing a pastor's meeting on uh, Zoom the other day. And one of the pastors said the kids in the middle school, had in the church school, basically shifted their views and had embraced transgender ideology just because of the culture, because it's, it's the thing. And um, uh, he said they watched the movie, he said shifted all of them. He said they all embraced when they heard the testimonies of the changed lives and the pain and everything going on. So we must recognize the degree to which young people in particular are turned off to the church because the church hates gays, because we're so mean to gays because the Bible attacks gays. That's the perception. And what we have to have is a heart of love, so if you cut us, we bleed love. And, and we have to say God has a better way. God has a better way. We'll be hated for the message, but we cannot ignore that. Yeah. 
So as, as to optimism, I want to say three things. Number one, by nature, I am massively optimistic. Uh, the joke is that Nancy, my bride of 45 plus years, is the lead weight that keeps my helium balloon from flying away. So we kind of balance each other out like that. Because she's always going to tell you what's going to go wrong. And I'm like, this is going to be great. Let's just do it. Um, so I, just by nature, am super optimistic. The second thing is, if I was just giving an assessment by what I see with my eyes, I'd be very pessimistic. I would absolutely be discouraged and think that America is not going to recover from this and the church in America is going to be like the church of a lot of Europe. We're going to become totally post-Christian based on what I see. However, the same God that promised me in 1983 that I would, I would be involved in a revival, he'd use me in a revival that would touch the whole world. He spoke that to me in 83. We had over 130 nations come to Pensacola, and the missions movement birthed out of that. Um, he promised me repeatedly, beginning in the late 1990s, that as surely as there was a civil rights movement in America, that there was going to be a gospel-based moral and cultural revolution, and I get to be right in the middle of it. He's promised me that. And I, every day when I'm... When he started speaking that to me, he also started speaking to me about being on radio and talk radio, which was outlandish. Because of being on radio every day was a complete impossibility. I had no connection, it was, it was outlandish, but he began to stir my heart, it's gonna happen. Every day I'm introduced on the radio, and I didn't set the script up, someone else proposed it after listening to me. Every day I'm introduced as your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. And it's a constant reminder to me that God's gonna do something. Now, you can obviously project things wrong prophetically in timing, maybe me being involved with it means students, whatever. But as far as I understand, uh, it's something that is, is on the very near horizon. And I've said for years that there's gonna be a pushback, that, that the left or the right, whoever you wanna point, you know, paint it, will overplay its hand. And, and what's happened with transgender activism, that's creating some of the pushback. So that you have different states now saying, hey, we just want to be fair to girls. Just, you know, you have, I mean, think of the irony of this. Bruce slash Caitlyn Jenner, right, is now running for governor of California as a conservative, right? So it's an interesting world we're living in. And speaking out against biological boys competing against girls, saying it's not fair. So, and, and then you, you, you have now in, in England, there's an outcry because you have more and more of these trans-identified kids and young adults who are trying to detransition. Mm -hmm. But you've, you've got 20-year-old girls who've had full sex change surgery. And they say, what did, I, what did I do? I was confused as a teenager. And the medical profession went along with it. I now have interacted at length on the phone with a female to male, Scott Nugent, who wrote a passionate article in Newsweek. Just look for Nugent Transgender, Newsweek. Passionate article warning about sex change surgery. Warning, saying it's basically killing him, her, and, and saying, I'll work with, I'll work with evangelical. We've got, to, we've got to save the young people from this. We've got to stop this from happening. So here we are, he and I talking on the phone at length, or she and I, to, you know, to be biologically true. And his business, call me she, that's fine. You know, still I'm a biological woman. I mean, that's the reality. That's what he was saying. But the pushback is here. Yeah. E even with, with race issues and things, of course, where, where the, the legacy of racism exists in America, of course we want to deal with it. And obviously we can't have equal outcomes, but where we don't have equal opportunity, we're, we finally want to address it. And okay, why is it that the average net worth of a black family in America is a fraction of a white family? Because they have history. So fine, I want to be aware of those. I want to look at those things. But the extremes that things go to, and then you get basically a racism in reverse, it's, it's all going to backfire. Um, you know, Josh Hawley, Senator Hawley, writes a book, The Tyranny of Big Tech. It's, it's going to be published by Simon & Schuster. Uh, and then, uh, so it's Tyranny of Big Tech, that's the name of the book. He then, the day before the, the storming of the Capitol, calls for, with Ted Cruz, 
if there's been fraud, let's look. If not, great, let's move on. But let's just put this to rest. Well, let's investigate it for a little while and then put it to rest and, and do it before the inauguration. So, you know, fair call. So then the next day, the storming on the Capitol. So he's blamed as now being an instigator, etc. So Simon and Schuster says, we are dropping his book. The tyranny of big tech. And this is as Trump is getting banned by Twitter for life, right? And he's written a book on the tyranny of big tech that's now getting canceled, right? So cancel culture. So what happens, you knew it was coming. Regnery, a big conservative publisher, uh, releases it instead. It released today as, when I saw it was last, it was the number four book in the nation. That's how it released. So what we have to do is as there's the determination to cancel us, yeah. we have to speak up. The more there's the attempt to cancel us, we have to speak up. Every, every pitfall has to become a platform yeah. to get our message out. And I think the thing that you said that uh, resonates with me so much is that uh, those that are those that are finding their identity and finding their cause in a lot of these movements aren't doing it because they're just openly wanting to be destructive. They're searching for an answer. They see the brokenness in the world and they're searching for a way. And so there's this channel, there's this channel and, and behind even like the LGBT conversation, it's like it's easy to objectify a whole group of people. That's what the enemy wants us to do. But we gotta be people of grace and truth because behind every one of their, their, uh, their arguments is a pain and it's a brokenness that Jesus came to heal and to resolve, you know, to, even in the, the racial issue that's going on in our country. We may not like the expression of it, but we have to acknowledge. We have to acknowledge the pain and we have to acknowledge the person's experience. And as soon as we shut them down and we, we go over here into our corner, into our political boxing ring and say, no, let me fight my position against yours, we lose, we lose uh, that conversation. Yeah, and, and I know I've got to run in a second to the airport, but the, I live in many areas of my life in holy tension. And that word reach out and resist is a word God gave me in 2004, 2005. Reach out and resist. Reach out to the gay community with compassion. Resist the agenda with courage. Reach out and resist hearts of compassion yeah. with backbones of steel. So it's the same with anti-Semitism and my Jewish people. I reach out to the Jewish people with the gospel right. and I resist anti-Semitism against right. the Jewish people. The same thing with, with, with the culture wars, with race issues. On the one hand, you... you, you you resist you know, the wokeism right. and the extremes, but then you reach out where there is right. pain, or there are, there are issues. So we have to live with a certain holy tension. Yeah. And, and we can't, we know right now, that especially most of us white evangelicals, we are looked at, every one of you, you are a white supremacist Trump supporter. And you were there storming the Capitol. That's the way we're looked at. So through interpersonal relationships especially, we have to show people who we really are. Yeah. And it's not a matter of how we voted, it's how we're caricatured. Yeah. That's the thing. So we have to overcome the stereotypes, but they are there. Yeah. You, you are, you are a gay-hating, Nazi, white supremacist bigot. Yeah. That's basically the narrative, and you're gonna overcome that by loving your neighbors yourself. And as Martin Luther King said, hate cannot overcome hate. Yeah, hate can't it drive out hate. It takes love to do that. Exactly. And we've got to be people that demonstrate love. And sometimes that's going to mean we're going to have to take a third way. Yes. We're, gonna, we're not going to be able to find our way in the world in a current path or get sucked into a different aisle or a different lane. We've got to walk the path of Jesus. Yes. And that grace and truth. He came, the word of God came to us in John 1, full of grace exactly. and truth. Exactly. And Jesus is perfect grace and he is perfect love. Amen. Come on, thank you, Pastor. Or I, I'll call you Pastor, but you're Doctor. Anyway. Would you would you do us the honor real quick? I know you gotta go, but would you just pray over us? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Thank you, Lord. Well, I don't do this often, but let me do this. The priestly blessing from number six. Yevarecha Adonai, v'yishmarecha. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord causes his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift his face upon you and grant you peace. Lord, your blessing, your smile, your favor, your grace, your presence on your people. A stream of revival, Lord, that will last for generations. 
a holy, moral, and cultural revolution that will glorify the name of Jesus and the greatest harvest we've ever seen. May we be ready for it, Father. May we be disciples who make disciples. May Jesus be exalted. We ask it in his name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Yes, sir.